Thank you so much and good afternoon. Uh, this is our fourth and last panel associated with building bridges and breaking barriers that exposed us to issues that are commonly shared with our diverse communities and intergenerational audiences. Thank you for being here and supporting our endeavors. This afternoon is another opportunity to meet the artist, uh, Francesca Pastin, uh, Mary Curtis Radcliffe, and Elizabeth Scher. Uh, each of them has an impressive resume, long list of accomplishments in the art field and beyond. We will learn a bit more about their background, featured artworks, alternative spaces, sheltering in place, and their thoughts about breaking barriers and building bridges. I look forward to a stimulating panel discussion. So now I go to my first question. And uh, I just want to remind the panelists that uh, to keep your, uh, your responses short, but not, uh, not so abbreviated that uh, I, am, uh, I am blocking you for sharing information that we all are eager to hear. But just be mindful of, the, uh, of our time and it's 18 minutes for this whole first session. So I am starting with, um, a, okay, so let me introduce Francesca, Mary Curtis and Elizabeth in that order. And I want you to tell, introduce yourself uh, and tell us, tell the audience what you want them to know about you. Francesca. <clears throat> well, first, thank you, Hannah and Margarita for all your organization to put this together. And I'm thrilled to be able to show my work and talk about it, so thanks. Um, I was born in New York City and my parents met at the Art Students League. So naturally, <laughs> they're both artists. And my earliest memories were of my room filled with paintings and drawings that my mom created on every surface, including the walls, the ceilings, and the furniture. And they were not cute children's stuff. They were real <clears throat> exquisite artworks. Um, so art came to me like breathing and I never thought about making art. It was just an integral facet of my existence. I started out as an avid photographer, but later started painting and I got both my MFA and BFA at the San Francisco Art Institute. I've been exhibiting my work regularly and teaching since 1995. My work is concept driven and I work in various media, including sculpture, drawing, printmaking and paper cutting. I consider, I consider my most successful work a question and not an answer. And because I'm very influenced by the feminist art movement, my work often takes the form of accumulations, repetition, layering, and time intensive process. Okay, so uh, let's um, just, are you done? Oh. So I could talk about perfection if I have time, or we can go on. Okay, thank you. So uh, now, yeah, uh, Mary Kirk, please. Okay, I was born in Chicago and grew up outside of Detroit in Birmingham, Michigan. Um, I spent some time going to school in Europe when I was 15, 16, 17, then came back to America and went to a junior college where um, outside of Boston where I, I had a professor who uh, realized I was an artist because at age 19, I you know, I didn't really quite know. So he said, you know, you should go to the Rhode Island School of Design. I said, huh? <laughs> anyway, that's what I ended up doing. And I majored in sculpture and um, then uh, came, it, well, it's a long story. Anyway, I, I came to the San Francisco permanently in 1973 and started doing a series of three-dimensional works, which were wind sculptures, long, huge, big, tall sculptures, about 12 feet long with ribbons dangling down and blowing in the wind. And so I've been actually been being an artist out here for almost 50 years. And mainly I did sculpture 
And then I, for about 20 years in there, I did two dimensional works on paper where I did collage and um, painting and drawing. And um, also in the meantime, I, I had gotten a degree from RISD to teach children. So that was the main thing I did to earn money. Although I worked for the Renaissance Fair for Lucasfilm, just about every job you can imagine. My, right. And so um, now I, here I am doing three-dimensional design again. Okay. Thank you so much. And now Elizabeth. Okay, um, I came to the Bay Area in 1962 to Cal and I majored in art there and I got a master's there. But in between, I went back to Washington DC where I'm from. My parents were very interested in politics. I'm still a news junkie. And um, that summer, that year there, anyway, I worked in the White House when Jack Kennedy was president. And I was so excited to send all my <laughs> California friends the fact that I was working in the White House for, but then they thought it was the White House department store that used to be in San Francisco. So they weren't really impressed. So um, I, <laughs> I taught at California College of the Arts, formerly CCAC for 40 years. Um, and I work in 2D and film. I, I started in painting and printmaking and then moved to include film. I love nature and I love technology. Uh, both of which play a really important part in my practice and my life. So working out and making art keep me sane, centered, and engaged. So otherwise, I would just be crazy. So now I don't teach anymore. Um, I just make art and films. Okay, thank you very much. Now I have a, quest a burning question, and I really want you to tell me about your earliest memories of going to museums. Museums are, oh my God. Uh, museums uh, have been very much a, a love of my, um, of my life. And uh, I started uh, dreaming about working in museums and so forth at the age of uh, 14. So at any rate, so I want to ask you, about your experience, your memories of uh, going to museums and what impact did it have uh, on, uh, uh, on you and your particular work as an artist activities and um, really what is that, what artists and what is the last, uh, lasting impression? Uh, yeah, let's, uh, let me start with Mary. Mary Curtis. Um, yes, I uh, went to, we, in Birmingham, Michigan, we um, were a couple of miles from Cranbrook Art Institute. And so um, we used to go there all the time for all sorts of different things. And, um, but they had an incredible art museum and that was the first museum I went to. And then my mother would take us to Chicago and go to the Chicago Art Institute, my brother and I. And so we really grew up seeing, uh, you know, really amazing artwork from the time we were very, very young. Um, so and can I interrupt and ask you? Certainly. Do you think? Do you think that the exposure at such an early age has stayed with you, and how important is it? Yes, absolutely. Yes, I. See, I made things. I made things with my hands ever, since I was a little tiny girl. I didn't think of it as art per se. So it took that professor at, at uh, Pine Manor Junior College to recognize I was an artist when I was 19. I just always made things, but I had this incredible background of, of and then going to uh, New York City as well as a child and going to MoMA. And so that all just stayed with me. And, um, and it was very important to me. Yeah, Elizabeth? Well, my, I, my parents really didn't go to art museums, but they were from the Midwest and my mother would take visitors on tours and I would go with her. So we went to the Smithsonian, but I didn't really have a lot of exposure except in kindergarten, I met my best friend the first day and she already knew she wanted to be an artist. So I knew that, but like Mary Curtis, I always made things at camp and all the time, but I didn't think of it as art. 
And then as an art major, I took a lot of art history classes. So I became familiar with the canon, mostly male, um, but I saw it on slides. That was back when they showed slides in art history and some of them were pretty bad. But later <laughs> as an adult, I went, I, I mean, the quality of them were pretty bad. I went on one of M. Louise Stanley's art lovers tours to Italy. And when I walked into the Uffizi, that first room has a giant Madonna and Child by Duccio, Giotto and Cimabue. That's all that was in that room. And I literally fell to my knees. It was such a different experience to see the art rather than the slide of the art that I knew then the importance of seeing art in person. It's a little bit better now with the internet, but not much. And I still think it's super important to see art in person. And I hope everybody keeps going to museums and galleries. What, hey, uh, what happened here? Uh, something is wrong. Can I don't you know. Exit out. I think someone is sharing the screen. Hold on, let me. See it, if can... it says. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. okay. So now, uh, Francesca, can you tell your story quickly? Um, hey, when um, well, my dad and mom divorced, and I grew up with my mom in Virginia. But when I visited my dad in New York, we went to many galleries, including the Met. And my, one gallery that I've always visited every time I go to New York is the Frick, because it's I just love that it's out of the you know art gallery context and, and an individual home. But um, I went to a lot of galleries and that was a seminal experience. In um, the late seventies, my dad and I actually saw the first plate paintings of Julian Schnabel, which opened up to me what a painting doesn't have, you know, what the painting can be that you could push the paint media and you could stick plates into it. And they were enormous and just thrilling. Um, Judy Chicago at SF MoMA in 1979 made an enormous, um, had an enormous influence on me because it introduced me to the Cal Arts Feminist Program. And that opened up a lot of more possibilities of art. And also I think that that, um, the whole Cal Arts Program is so instrumental and, and contemporary art. It came up with abject art, installation art, um, a myriad of possibilities of art that really could hold low, low and high art, et cetera, all were generated through that um, movement. Uh, but re not more recently in 1991, I went to, um, Berkeley Art Museum and I saw one of my really favorite artists, which is Rosemary Trockel. Um, she's an amazing German artist. She challenged um, the uh, institutional uh, and she also elevated the notion of women's work as valid art. Uh, she had an incredibly sly wit. And um, for instance, she would turn the, um, the Judd um, cube into a stove by putting burners on the top. Um, <laughs> she worked with symbols, which are particularly important with me and my art. Uh, for instance, uh, wool, the wool symbol became breasts. Um, household irons became menacing and dangerous in her art. And the hammer and sickle became deflated as a decorative elements. So this kind of play with symbolism was very seminal in how I think about my own art. Thank you. So now we are going to uh, go into your uh, art with the uh, art, art, uh, artworks that are featured in this exhibition. And I want to start with uh, Mary Curtis and I want you to tell me uh, to introduce your work and uh, also the reason for choosing it. And uh, remind people why, uh, what uh, we wanted to accomplish in this exhibition, uh, that we had an, a, a first an early work, and then I wanted to, to compare it with the later, uh, with the later uh, phase 
of your work. So uh, what was the reason for you choosing those? Well, in, in um, right after 9-11, and uh, my husband and I went around the world and the first stop was Hong Kong. So when I got there, it's an amazing city. So I took a whole bunch of photographs and um, uh, what happened was, if you see in the upper left-hand corner, there's uh, also a, a photograph from Hong Kong, and that was made by an ancestor, of, well, a, a relative from about 1955. And so when I realized I could marry the hillside, if you can see at the very top, the hills kind of go together and the, the um, photograph to the right of that one is one I took from the top of the mountain, looking down on the harbor. Now, there, Hong Kong is an amazing place. It has a flower, a, um, a flower mart, which you see the bouquets of flowers. And, um, and then also on the street, I found those wild looking colored wigs, blue and green and yellow wigs. And so I just decided to take some calligraphy um, from that I found in some of the things that I'd saved and collage it into place. Um, but a lot of it is image transfer, actually. So I transferred the image and then I colored the image. And wushu is the name of the martial arts that the figure on the right in yellow and the red figure are practicing. So okay. that was from 2003. I did a whole series of prints. That's I was in. I was doing my twenty years of two-dimensional work when I did this. So, what about your second work? My my second work, yes. This is um, from the scrapbook series, which I will get into a little bit later. But in the very middle, you'll see a strip um, uh, from the uh, Wushu Hong Kong print. Now, all these strips are from other prints I made from uh, original works of art. They were test strips. And when I was doing my scrapbook series, I found them and they were all about the same size. And I decided to line all five of them up and then weave other um, horizontal members across it. So it is made of a um, test strips from prints that I have. Well, it's really the, interesting. Yeah, it's really you. interesting how you connected the past with the more recent one. And right. uh, yeah, so it's an interesting way of recycling. And tell us a little bit about your philosophy of uh, or practice of recycling and be very short about that. Okay. Um, I did a series of scrap works this past um, year when we were in, in lockdown because I, I couldn't do anything else. So I opened a file drawer and I found uh, tons of scraps I'd say for about the last 15 years from other artworks. And I started making um, and recycling those uh, scraps. Some were circular, some were strips, some were corners. And I made about 29 works of art in the scrap works series. And this is one of them. Okay, so now uh, I am going to, uh, we will talk a little bit later about uh, your association with uh, Mercury 20th. I want to quickly go to Elizabeth Chair now. And Elizabeth, tell us uh, briefly about, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, tell us uh, briefly about. Uh, your uh, your career and why are we seeing what we are seeing? Because that was an early work. Yeah, okay, okay. It, it, it is an earlier work. Um, I had, this is from um, a, a, a short film I made called Too Young. My daughter and her friends are in it and um, it's to a, a one-shot wonder band. And then, um, and then the song was, <laughs> So the owner, the band said I could use the film, but the owner apparently had an owner. They didn't tell me that. And then it, I had to take it out of a big film show 
in, uh, in San Francisco, but Bruce Connor told me to keep showing it anyway. So, so I have, but um, I had love art and artists, but I had become really disillusioned with the art world. It, it, back in those days, the artists had no control over themselves. Like with the internet, you can promote yourself, but then, you know, even getting a color card for a show was a huge deal. And I didn't like that. And I had a friend who was starting to do video and he was pushing me to make films. So um, you can show a film anywhere and all people have to do is show up and pay a small admission fee or not. And that's a success. In an art show, the gold standard still is a sale. So I love that part of filmmaking. And when I made my first film, which was a satire on toilet training, um, <laughs> I, um, someone had sent me a book, How to Toilet Train Your Child in Less Than a Day, The Behavior Modification System. And my son wasn't interested. And I thought, oh, this is so militaristic. So I decided to make this satire and I got films on how-to films from the Navy from a kid who answered the phone and my drawing class and I watched how to make them. And I filmed it for three weekends in my kitchen. And when I went to the head of the film department where I had borrowed the equipment, he said, well, you made a training film, not a satire. And I had this light bulb aha moment and I totally got it. And I went back and chopped it up and I didn't know the rules at all. It was all the no-nos, but I know how to make a film. It was such an eye-opening because the weight of how to make art was weighing me down from being myself. So I made the film. There were a lot of women's shows. I brought a projector, I'd set up in the corner, the lights would go out and everybody had to come over and see the film and they laughed right where I wanted them to. And I thought, this, this is fantastic. So for 20 years, I did not show art. I taught it and I made it, but I didn't show it. Now I did again when technology showed up and um, that's how I started making films. Then I got into longer documentaries. Okay. I make films Good. about women, art, health, and aging. Okay, great. So now this is perfect. And uh, so now I want you to talk about your second piece in uh, the exhibition, which is about the digital divide. And as we know, this is a loaded term yes. and it refers to the gap between those able to benefit from digital age and those who are not. And I would just be, and especially it became very pronounced during COVID-19 for those people who cannot uh, access, uh, don't have um, access to computers and so forth. And then uh, recently I read that 7% of US adults say they don't use the internet according to Pew Research Center conducted February, 2021. So go ahead, go ahead and please keep your remarks short. Okay, so yes, I'm hoping Biden's infrastructure program will help to start to solve this problem, just like Franklin Delano Roosevelt's rural, rural electrification program helped with that. And so that's very important. But I am also interested in the issues of ecology and mental health. And, the, and so the digital divide for me also is about nature and technology when they are in conflict or confluence because there's so much toxic waste from all the technological devices, throwaway devices, that it's really a big issue. And also people are running around with their faces in their iPhones and ear plugs in, and they're missing out on just being in nature. And I love nature and I love technology, but I think it's really important to, to be able to unplug some of the time. The, this piece is anthropomorphic. It, it looks like two heads. And it's taken based on a photograph I took. Um, I have a little house on the Russian River and it's the Pacific Ocean. So it's like the end of the world in, a, in the end of the United States. And this is at the shore and the blue squares represent digits. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. This, yeah. is, another, this is another one where it looks like a bear. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, giving, uh, discussing this, uh, these images and this particular series that are so relevant. And now I want to invite uh, Francesca and to speak about her pieces. 
And let me just give a very short introduction here that uh, Sarah Thurton is an, she used to cover uh, art, art for the economist. And she published a book in 2008 called uh, called uh, Seven Days in the Art World. So they are for each issue, like from uh, the importance of board or art fairs or auctions, uh, what is uh, the role of a curator, th different topics like that. And uh, she also happened to write about the magazine and the magazine refers to Art Forum. And basically what she's saying that Art Forum is to Art World what Vogue is to fashion and Rolling Stone was to rock and roll. So take it from there. Um, sure, and another thing that she said in that book, which I find interesting is that, you know, with as much authority as Art Forum has, their offices are actually very tiny. And I think there are like three people working there. Since that book, I don't know if it's expanded since, but it's kind of a very small operation, which sort of surprised me. But yeah, it has enormous weight, um, both uh, figuratively and you know realistically. It weighs a lot. Um, yeah, my work with it's a big ma bloated magazine, depending on you know how much money the art world is generating. So I consider my work with the Art Forum magazine as a way for me to mess with authenticity and authority. And I see uh, my Art Forum pieces as an unsolicited collaboration with the magazine, the art world, and the cover artist. I um, started noticing in the early aughts um, that my friends all hoarded their art mag their their art forms because they're very glossy. They're very hard to dispose of, um, and um, I was also attracted to the fact that they're unusual and that they're square. They're not rectangular like most art magazines. And during the bloated art moment of the arts, they uh, were very thick, and it made them automatically into sort of an object. So that's where my idea of cutting into it um, came, is that I wanted to enhance the objectness of the art forms. Uh, for me, they act like an archeological investigation. I use the cover as a starting point and I dig through it, um, kind of reforming, or as you can say, deforming the magazine and, and asserting myself into the concept of the art form. So they became something um, of a symbol, which I'm very interested in the idea of symbols, harking back to Rosemary Trockel and also a filmmaker who's very seminal in my newest work, uh, Andre Tarkovsky, who's also films deal uh, a lot with symbols. Okay, so now I, I just uh, want everybody to notice that Right there, you have uh, Andy Warhol. So, uh, was there a particular reason why you uh, you featured him, and uh, what was his relationship with the Art Forum? Um, I'm particularly interested in Andy Warhol as an artist at the frontier of conceptualism, not just pop art. Uh, Duchamp made the ready-made, but um, Andy Warhol took it a step further by creating the faux ready-made by sort of flat footing the painting the Campbell's soup cans and the Brillo boxes that were um, ready-made once removed. I think he's a really important artist because he's one of the rare artists that um, came up with a completely new way of thinking about art with the, the once removed ready-made and also the personification. And I feel like he's an important artist in that way, in the same way that someone like Eva Hess is that through her work with latex created a, 
absolute new expression that had never been seen before in the art world. And also, whether you like him or not, I would say Jackson Pollock um, created the, uh, brought together the zeitgeist of the abstract um, expressionist movement into his, his paintings, which make, makes, if you think about just abstract expressionist and where it came from, it's just an incredibly volcanic, volcanic eruption in the art world and a completely new way of thinking about art. So Andy Warhol is, is really important in that and therefore important within the context of the art form magazine. Okay, now, thank you so much for elaborating on that point. And now I want you to move uh, quickly and tell us about uh, the second art piece that is featured in this exhibition. And uh, you, uh, it's part of uh, Making Contact. It's a whole series that you worked on. And uh, just tell us about uh, your migration to creating them. Okay, so, um, well, around 2016, a lot of circumstances converged. Um, mainly it was my New Year's resolution in 2016, which was to be more curious because I was a little concerned about my age. And I thought, if you stop being curious, you'll age more. Like being curious <laughs> is, you know, helps you stay young. So after I made that New Year's resolution in the news, um, shortly after was um, the Martian rover curiosity that um, went, um, that, that, you know, was on Mars, exploring Mars. And I thought, well, isn't this interesting? It's a metaphor for the artist where it goes into a new territory and explores a, a, an unknown, region, um, very much like the uh, movement in the um, 1800s of the sublime and landscape in England and the, um, the United States. So, um, so I became interested, interested in the Curiosity Mars rover um, and um, that inspired my curiosity paintings, which um, I did in 2017. I had a show of them in 2017. Um, also, well, just back to the curiosity paintings, they were basically um, watercolor and they all had this void, which represented the artistic ferment, the act of creation, the, sub the sublime and, and that sort of thing within the art world. So also in the summer of 2017, I had done a series of collages using diamonds that I cut out from the New York Times. Now, if you're familiar with my artwork, if you, or if you wanted to look at my website, you'll see that I um, use the New York Times pages, the actual pages in my artwork. I get the New York Times every day. Um, I subscribe to it and it's an important part of my life. So I tend to use it. So I cut out the diamonds and the Tiffany ads and that sort of thing. And I copied them on a really funky screen, distorted them and revealed the um, imperfections of Ben Days and, and weird stuff that happens in newspapers. Um, so, but mainly I became, so I did a series of collages in the summer and I became very interested in their structure. So I got the idea to soak screen the diamonds onto them, onto the watercolors to create structure in the watercolors. And honestly, I've never done printmaking, so I had to learn how to do that. And it was a really exciting process. Plus, I was really, really lucky because I'm only three blocks away from the Mission Cultural Center, which houses a screen, half a like warehouse of screen printing um, equipment and tables that by the way, um, has a really incredible history. It's where all the Hispanic protest posters were created in the seventies through co-ops and individual artists. And um, they just had a show of those posters. Um, that hundreds of posters were made there and they have them at the Mission Cultural Center. And in fact, the uh, Smithsonian just bought some for a poster show that they're gonna have uh, I think in a few years now. Okay. Um, 
So anyway, I, um, that brings me to, I was really interested in using the diamond as a structure, um, which um, brings me to Andre Tarkovsky and his movie Solaris. Uh, Solaris is a planet uh, with a seemingly sentient ocean that peers into people's minds and manifests them, manifests what is inside their minds. Uh, but the movie also articulates the relationship between time and the individual merging past and present into one plane of existence. So for me, the curiosity and the resulting series with watercolors and diamonds was about my artistic process, my finding um, something um, out of nothing, which is you know what artists do. And um, this process is sort of met, um, mediates between my unconscious and my conscious, my past and my future, and the abstract dimensions of time and space. Hence my series on time travel, the astronaut, and making contact in particular, uh, at which point my ideas lock into, pl into place and connect the moment when um, thought becomes form, which is the artistic process to me. It's that incohate thought and all of a sudden something comes from it. The gem series is the culmination of the process of um, all the series that came before it. And in my mind is the gem series encapsulates um, all my ideas. And with this series, I'm not even halfway into it. I have a lot more to go with it. So it's very, very exciting. Thank you. So now I want to go back to, uh, so my next question is, uh, I'm transitioning into a new topic and it's about uh, COVID-19 and a lot of people have taken on COVID uh, and how they um, took advantage of sh sheltering and some artists have been very, very productive. So um, it had a, a different type of effect on them. So I want to ask uh, that uh, you show the work of uh, Mary Curtis and she and we have mentioned briefly that she has she current, currently is exhibiting at the Mercury 20th. So I want you to tell us about Mercury 20th very briefly. What is your role? Why? Uh, what is this uh, organization about? And why does it exist? Mercury 20 Gallery is a gallery on 25th Street in Oakland. Um, between Broadway and Telegraph. It started in 2006. I became a member in 2008. It's an artist-run gallery. And w the, the advantage of being an artist-run gallery is it's a, not a commercial gallery, so you can do whatever you want there. And that, to me, is a big uh, plus. We all have jobs there. Um, we have the, I was on the LLC and now I'm on the steering committee. I'm the archivist. Um, Elizabeth is doing a wonderful new podcast that uh, we have yet to uh, hear the first, um, first podcast, but you can do anything you want there. And it's quite marvelous. Now, this particular piece is a piece that I, um, as I said, in the, in the early 70s, I was doing kinetic sculpture. And about five years ago, I started doing kinetic sculpture again. And I said, wait a minute, didn't I do this kind of thing about 40 years ago? I said, yes. And so anyway, these pieces are um, all suspended. Each one of this, this piece is called Bay Fugue and it's uh, 12 feet wide, seven feet tall, and seven feet deep. So it's the largest one I've ever done. And it's, uh, it's done on um, Duralar, which is a mylar kind of material that's very strong. And um, it's a painting. And that's a big stretch for me because I'm not, I don't consider myself a painter, but I just decided to go for it. 
And usually I make my kinetic works with three elements. This one has four. Anyway, the one of the impetuses of making these um, kinetic works is that they have a very calming vibration and uh, they're kind of serene. So I've been trying for years to get them into hospital lobbies and hospitals where they can benefit people that are there, either the doctors or the nurses or the support staff or the patients. So that's the direction I, I'm continuing to go in to try to um, install these pieces in healing environments. And after being an artist for almost 50 years, I like the idea of being of use. I feel I've been very privileged to be able to do my work for all these years and I've never stopped. And so now I want to give back to the community and to have my work be of use to the community. So that's the direction I'm, I'm on. Thank you very much. And now very quickly, I'm moving to Elizabeth. And Elizabeth, uh, tell us about the smoke screen. And uh, this is also part of what you were able to accomplish during the crisis that we had in California in uh, COVID and all what have you. So please just describe to us very quickly that image. Okay, well, I have to give a little background first. During lockdown, my husband and I moved up to a cottage we have on the Russian River. And I took a pad of graph paper and I, I, I became obsessed with making X's and O's in these various configurations. And I realized that, that the X's and O's were symbols for hugs and kisses and that we couldn't have and for all the love that we needed. But then the fires and smoke came and the air was foul. And so I took a window screen and I went around up there taking landscape photos through these screens. And that became the series smoke screens. And then when I came back to Oakland, I was waiting at Kaiser to get my COVID test. And I looked to my left and there was a fence and a screen. And so I took that picture. These are all manipulated heavily in Photoshop and printed on metal. And this particular one is called smoke screen caged, sort of a metaphor for how a lot of us felt. Both those series just showed at Mercury 20 where I am a member, not as long as Mary Curtis, but for four years. And they just finished the show right before hers. Right. And the reason why I was showing Mary's sculpture, uh, kinetic art sculpture, is because she was not ready when we started this exhibition. So I really yeah. didn't want to miss that chance. Uh, and uh, considering that the whole world is watching us, so why not? Okay, so now I just want to ask uh, 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 Francesca to tell us about her experience with, uh, with gallery representation. <clears throat> We spoke about an alternative uh, place and, uh, and uh, we heard that Elizabeth and uh, Mary Curtis are uh, involved in that. And uh, tell us about your uh, journey into the gallery representation, the gallery world. Um, okay, well, I'm going to a gallery. Jessica? Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. So I got into a gallery right after grad school. So I've been in the galleries more than out of them. Um, my experience with the gallery is, and as opposed to alternative spaces, is there are two separate things. Alternative spaces, um, when you show an alternative space, it's about the art. When you show it a gallery, it's about the art sale. And one of the most annoying things about showing in a gallery and having a gallery show is your friend, first thing people ask is, did you sell anything? And it's not exactly what I want my art to be about. I want my art to be about itself. Um, obviously I'm not, well, I'm not individually wealthy, so I need to make sales, but the hope is that the, the um, work is about, I mean, it is unusual in a gallery if that's not the main thing. So um, alternative spaces, I like to show in alternative spaces because the focus is then on the art. 
Um, I think when galleries are working for you, it's great. If you're an artist, you know, and your interests align with the gallery and you have a really great relationship with that gallery and it's working for you, it's a really wonderful thing. Um, but that your interests don't necessarily align because artists and galleries, they're sort of like oil and water, right? Your interests are different and that you're, it's a difference between a commercial space and an authentic artist whose interest is about making interesting work. Um, to all the artists, um, do you feel your art has radically changed in this time period that you're talking about? Or do you see a thread that's, you know, continuing? Um, I'm looking at all of your work and I don't see that huge a jump. I, I see a continuation and I just wonder what you think. I'm gonna jump in, okay, ladies, other fellow panelists. Yeah, sure. You know, all of us have been making work for so many decades that I think it's our practice. It's like brushing your teeth. So it changes over time, but it didn't radically change because of COVID. I mean, in fact, at the Russian River, I felt like I was at an artist residency, like I've been going to out of the country for the past decade. It was just la vida pura. You know, I cooked, I walked, I did yoga and I made art and I repeat, you know, that's what I did every day. It, it was a little uh, less chaotic than my normal life. And now as things are opening up, my dance card is getting fuller again. And I'm just hoping I can hang on to that simple feeling that, that a lot of us, not just artists, experience during COVID when things slowed down. And I really appreciate that. And I'm gonna work really hard to hang on to that. Yes, I felt like um, I was at an artist residency in a way. My husband wrote a book of 300 pages during the time. <laughs> and I just kept going to my studio because there wasn't anyone else there. So it was safe enough just to go and on the regular times. And so I just kept going. And then I just started making all these scrap works pieces. And then the final one was the big uh, kinetic piece called Bay Fugue. So it, it really wasn't that um, different a uh, time for me. And I'll just continue doing kinetic works and I'll continue doing um, more collage and painting and drawing and just keep doing whatever I've been doing for the last number of decades. I feel very lucky. Okay, I noticed I have um, a question in chat. Um, do you think your art was influenced by the New York Expressionist? Actually, um, my art originally was influenced by San Francisco figurative expressionist, and I was a figurative painter. Um, and that's what was happening in San Francisco at the time um, in the 80s and mostly the 80s. And also in art school, particularly my MFA, even though I um, was in the painting department, they didn't have new genre. Well, they did have new genres, but you couldn't like cross discipline like you can now. Um, but nevertheless, I hung out with the new genres because I felt like I sort of already knew what I was doing with painting and I was more interested in ideas. And so I was able to study with the, the um, great conceptual San Francisco artists like Paul Koss in, in the new genre and Nayland Blake as well. Um, so, and just back to the... Um, gallery question to and speaking of Nayland Blake who's one of my teachers he um in our first class seminar class at the art institute he said that the artist is the most important thing the artist is the fulcrum which everything evolves around the the, the galleries the museums everything and that you have to um, because I think what happens is the art world can really kind of beat you down and make you feel insignificant, but you are the most significant component of the art community. And so I think it's really important that artists empower each other. And I think some of the most interesting art movements happen outside of the, uh, with artists who are not interested in um, 
normal art venues like right. um, what was the happenings in New York in the 70s and also like um, artists like Jay DeFeo um, in San Francisco, Wallace Berman, who were really working outside of conventional art venues and, and making more interesting art, I think, than those that were working within the system. Thank you. I think um, perhaps, I think it looks like Hannah joined us um, by phone. She is trying to get in and um, uh, we'll just give her another second. But I would like to um, go back to the questions that Hannah has prepared for us. She uh, luckily sent me a copy of those and see where <laughs> we are. Um, I think we covered the uh, discussion around uh, COVID. And I think one of the questions that Kenna wanted to raise is, uh, is around ageism, um, because it's also a very significant topic of this exhibition in general. And um, obviously this is what we explore in the exhibition. And this is um, a significant part of the mission of Ruth's Table. So her question was, as an artist, what can you teach us about ageism in the art world, art, art world and in general? What does it, how does it manifest itself? Do you perceive it as a serious barrier in your work? And is it a problem for women in the art specifically? Uh, and um, well, just in the order that you appear on my screen, uh, Francesca, would you mind to go first? Okay, um, ageism in the art world. I think things are shifting in that department. It's been really heartening to see, for me to see in the past few years, more older women artists being recognized and in fact, sort of becoming a trend. Um, there was a huge solo show of the abstract artist, Carmen Herrera, recently at the MoMA. Um, Hilma App Clint um, was a big thing. It was the biggest thing in New York just before the COVID shut down. Uh, Ethel Adnan, who's an older woman, um, showed at SF MoMA recently. And the gallery Hauser and Worth um, has made, um, is, is, is in the process of consciously revitalizing uh, older women artists such as Greta Bratisco, who is a fabulous um, Romanian conceptual artist. Uh, BAM has been really good at showing older women artists in particular, like uh, Sylvia Fine, who worked, does surrealist painting. She's still mm -hmm. alive. I think she's in her 90s. Mm -hmm. um, and locally, right here on Mission Street, a few blocks from my house, is Et Al Gallery, which just now had a show of a woman named Paula, Paula Brenner, I believe it was. They were showing work that she did in her 60s, which were beautiful abstract striped paintings using unusual color combinations. And um, so I think it needs to go further, but I, and I think um, when it becomes the norm rather than exception, uh, we will know we arrived. Thank you. Elizabeth? Yes, well, we have Anna is back well, here. Well, I, I think Francesca covered it really well. There, it is a moment for older women artists. Unfortunately, sometimes they have to die first, like Jay DeFeo. <laughs> got so much attention after she died, Metropolitan Museum of everywhere. And I know Jay very well, or knew Jay very well. So that, you know, you don't wanna have to wait till that happens, but there is a lot of, of attention. But ageism is everywhere and more so for women. And I think it's still an issue, but it, I think it's exciting that so many older women artists are, are being looked at again. Um, so that's what I think. Thank you. But I want to just say one other thing. Nobody keeps being an artist unless they have to make art. There's too much rejection. It's too much work. You spend so much time running your little business, even if it doesn't make any money. So I think the people who continue to make art into their older years are, are the people who have to make art and everyone else stops. Hey, hey. <laughs> I agree. So. Would you like me to uh, put in my two cents? Okay. 
Well, commercial galleries by tradition have always been looking for the, the young, handsome male artists, mostly um, over the decades, actually, that was been the, the situation. But there actually has been a real shift. And the, I found this article from um, January 19, 2017. And it's why old women have replaced young men as the art world's darlings. So actually it's very interesting in, in the last maybe three or four years, a lot of these um, institutions have a desire to actually reveal histories uh, that have been um, previously hidden. And so they have made big, huge shows like the Carmen Herrera and and of course, Louise Bourgeois actually got notoriety when she was in her 70s, I think, which was uh, unusual because usually she wouldn't have gotten known until she died, as Elizabeth pointed out. She hung out long enough. Yeah, she hung out long <laughs> enough. She was there. And she was eccentric and interesting Amazing. enough as well. So yeah, there's ageism. Come on, there's ageism and sexism. And, you know, we do, we always have to remember we live in a patriarchy, you know? So we're fighting it all a tooth and nail from the time we're little tiny girls until we die to try to get somebody to pay attention to us. <laughs> and it happens more or less. And, but that's not the point. As Elizabeth said, the point is you just, you don't let that kind of thing stop you. If you're, if you really are an artist, you, you can't not do your work. You just keep going and you keep trying to expand your, your uh, circle of people who know you and just keep going and things will happen. And, but there's no, there, there's never been a question in my mind. Could I stop? No. I go a little nuts if I don't do my work. I, I really have to run that kind of energy, that creative trance-like meditative energy on a very, very regular basis, or I go a little crazy. That's just who I am. So there's no stopping. You just keep going. And whether, no matter what's happening in the, you know, in our patriarchal culture, that's not gonna stop me. Thank you. And it really takes us to the next question, which is, um, we have two more questions to go. And I know we're kind of, uh, we, we're, you know, at the, uh, our 60 minute time point. So I would like to thank the audience again for being with us and uh, for spending this hour with us. If you'd like to stay longer, please do. We'll have two more questions. If you want to raise a question, um, you can do so now at any point point, muting yourself or submitting them via chat again. But we have two more questions to go. If you're willing to stay with us, we'll appreciate that. Um, and our next question is around building bridges. And really, um, this is that stems from the really name of our show, Breaking Barriers, Building Bridges, right? So what type of bridges do you envision uh, for the future that need to be built? And uh, where do those bridges take us, as you see? And what is the role of art in, um, and you know, helping um, address uh, such profound issues as ageism and in general help shape, shape attitudes and perspectives in our society. Uh, we'll go in a different order. Let's start with uh, Mary Curtis. Well, I, I was an art educator for a long time, um, many, many years and mostly to children. And um, I remember going to a museum in uh, France. And it was, you know, at Cezanne's, um, it, it was the, 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 the people who did impressionist paintings who are Americans. And there was a, an educator there and she was talking to a group of children who couldn't have been more than four or five years old. And I, I speak French so I could understand what she was saying. And she was talking very seriously about the painting, the composition, the colors, the lines, the textures. 
And I thought, God, I, I really wish that we had that kind of um, situation in our country where people took art seriously and, and educated children from a very young age. But that doesn't exist to that extent. Um, and so I think education is, is a way to, to build um, bridges and, and get through the barriers. But I don't know how that's going to happen because there isn't an art education um, component to the San Francisco schools and the elementary schools. At least it, there wasn't when I wanted to get a, a degree here or a, a certificate to teach art. So I actually ended up mostly in private schools. And the last school I taught in was the East Bay French American School. And um, they were mostly Europeans and, and they understood the, the, um, the, how important and culturally important um, art is for young children. So I don't know, you know, it's just sort of a, a, an ongoing thing that I've been trying to, to figure out for many years and um, maybe someday the Americans will get a little more sophisticated and start teaching art at a, a younger age to the children of our schools. Thank you. Elizabeth? Well, historically, every educated person wrote prose, played an instrument and drafted. That was part of everybody's education, even in the United States. But then it stopped happening. And I, when uh, abstraction came along, so traditionally art has always been part of the community. You know, it's always been a community worldwide, but then with abstraction, it became, no one understood it and the artist uh -huh. didn't care. And it was a very important movement in some ways, but it marginalized art because the average person couldn't understand it, said a monkey could do it, their dog could do it. So they weren't interested anymore. I've always been interested in art that was in some way building a bridge of accessibility to my audience and in film as well. And nowadays, even museums are trying to, you know, build broader audiences and become more accessible to make up for this space that had happened between the community, most people and the art world. So I see that as a positive thing. And I think the internet and everybody taking pictures and editing video. So I remember going to the Art Institute to see um, experimental films way back. There were maybe 10 people. Nobody knew what that was. It was before MTV. No one knew what they were looking at except this small group. Now everybody knows that. People are all, I think all boats rise when more people understand these kind of things. Not everyone's gonna be a genius, but everybody can participate. And I think it's moving in a good direction, especially when I see major museums reaching out cross-culturally and to youth and to the general public. So they welcome people to come in. Whereas before it was scary to go into a museum, you know, if you didn't feel qualified. I think it's positive. I mean, I think things are going in a good direction. Yeah. Although I agree with Mary Curtis, the schools should bring back art to little kids. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, hopefully um, Biden's agenda will do just that um, and bringing money into education. Um, I, I view Bridges in a more personal way. Um, the artists I respect and that are inspire me are always looking for the next bridge. They're not complacent. They don't, you know, sleep on their laurels. And my father was a real influence to me. His work, he worked all his life. He worked nine to five in a studio and went to Brighton Beach on Sundays, did chores on Saturdays. Um, and his artwork was really, really fresh. Even to his, his last work was always new and exciting. He um, experimented with a lot of media, a lot of ways of making art and, and, his, uh, and, and his own personal nar Jewish narrative in New York. So um, what I would say about bridges, there are certain um, people who like to travel to have new experiences in their life, but I'm more like um, the artist and the model of Giorgio Morandi or Joseph Hornell, 
Cornell or Edward Gorey, who um, never, that they don't necessarily need to venture in the world, but instead into their own creative mind. And um, that's why my series on curiosity, making contact and, and the gem series, as well as this metaphor, artistic exploration is very important to me. Um, so for me, the bridge is keeping my curiosity alive, looking forward to the what if, and, uh, and that's what keeps me going, as well as immersing myself in the process of seeing, discovering, and understanding the world afresh. Yeah. Our last question was really around the impact of COVID. We know that it has impacted so many areas of our, our lives and uh, so many industries as well, and, and undoubtedly the art world as well. And so the question is, um, how do you, do you see that change? Is it fun, you know, is the art world fundamentally changed? Or did it not, you know, was it not impacted? Uh, to that extent and what can we see from you in the future post pandemic and uh, if you want to share something about you um feel free to do so uh, let's start with Francesca. Okay. yes okay um yeah i think the pandemic um really changed my life because the mission cultural center came to a halting stop and that's where i was actively making all my art and um, um, and also I had to stop taking my ballet classes, which is a place for me to meditate and find my focus. So I started off with a really rough start. Um, in, the, in the COVID pandemic, I was quite floundering, but I did manage to do a, a mail art series, uh, mailing uh, postcards of the original artwork that I had done. Also build a print studio in my home and figure that out. Um, but post pandemic, and, and one thing that the pandemic did for me is it gave me a really much needed rest. I think I was really burned out and didn't realize it until I had to stop everything. And um, I had seen this film, um, The Last Black Man in San Francisco that had beautiful cinematography of the city. And, it, and I wanted to explore the city because I just live in the mission, which is somewhat blighted and depressing. And if you don't have art around, then there's like only blight. So I um, discovered, I, I um, researched and discovered all these fabulous parks in San Francisco. And I've somewhat gotten back into photography. I think the, um, the outcome of the pandemic, I think we were talking about it earlier before other people came online, is that there are different modes of, of seeing art and spreading art to a, a larger audience, like this discussion and the, gal and, and the viewing rooms. And I hope post pandemic that we hold on to the things that worked alongside of actual seeing art, which of course is, is, is very important. Thank you, Elizabeth. Well, I agree with a lot of the things that were, was just said. I, I, I will continue to make art. Um, my art is always based in the same processes, but it looks different. So I like to think of myself, you know, some places, especially commercial gallery, they want more of a linear progression to your art. And mine doesn't always look like it's a linear progression. I think of it like a musician, like Linda Ronstadt. She made oldies, she made Tex-Mex, she made um, uh, uh, anything. And every, every album was different, but it was still Linda Ronstadt. So I think of my art like that, that it can look different, but it's always still me. So I'm not sure what's gonna come next. Right now I started working on a, series of small panels made with um, tape, tape and drawing and paint. So this is like, I've done, I've done 24 of them. I seem to be obsessed with them right now. So <laughs> I guess that will happen. But I, what I wanted to say that with, it, did, it did, was a reset. I think it was a reset for everybody because everything stopped and that felt scary, but also good. And like I said before, I hope to hang on to some of that slowing down 
which is hard. You know, I live in Oakland at Jack London. Things are opening up. I'm grateful that the museums and galleries are opening up because I would like to start doing more of that again. But the pace is picking up. And I think artists are somewhat sponge-like and we, we absorb the, the general tenor of what's around us. And, you know, it's hard. In your studio, it's all blocked out but you aren't in your studio all the time. Just as much as you can be. <laughs> Mary Curtis? Well, um, last April or end of March, um, the person I, I work with who does a lot of printing for me from my photography, because all my work is based on my photography, shut his doors. So I thought, okay, what am I going to do now? So I went in my studio and I started looking through my flat files and I opened this one drawer and that drawer and drawer number four from the top had all these scraps that I had saved over the last maybe 15 years, which were trimmings from other artworks that I'd made. There were circular ones and there were corners and there were um, double corners and then there were straight ones that had some paint and digital printing. And so I just started making this series and I thought I'd make a few of these things. I ended up making 29. So it was kind of a wonderful artist in residency because I kept going and making these scrapbook series. And um, then I, for the future, um, I looked at a piece that, that's in my current show. And by the way, the show is open till six o'clock this Saturday, and that's the last day of the show. And there are two solo shows at Mercury 20 Gallery on 25th Street. Anyway, I looked at one of the kinetic pieces It's called Technicolor Trees. And I began to see, um, I had specifically made it with very little um, painting on it. So when it was lit, it would throw a bunch of shadows on the wall. And the shadows are continuously interacting with the pieces that are continuously moving. So it's never the same twice. It's in, and that interests me a lot. So I began to really look at it and thinking, okay, this is the direction I'm gonna go in. I'm gonna make more images on plexiglass discs with just a little bit of information and then light them in the same way so there will be more shadows. And that um, is interesting because you work with the negative space uh, more than the positive space. So that's the direction I'm going to be going in in the future. So I already have my new show at Mercury 20 halfway designed. <laughs> well, I'm glad we were able to take a little peek uh, on that uh, and be, be able to show this work as well. And um, thank you so much for this wonderful discussion. Can you hear me? Can you hear yeah. me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Anna. Okay, so uh, I really apologize. And for some reason, my computer is not cooperating with me, but okay. I, do have, uh, uh, I do have a concluding remarks. And what I want to say is, that uh, it's always uh, hard to say goodbye, but here we are and I'm thrilled that we had the opportunity to, to share this exhibition with you today. Over the past three months, these amazing works were, uh, were seen by approximately 1500 visitors. Yeah. Uh, most viewers are from the US, 90%. Uh, most uh, uh, from uh, from California, we had sixty percent. Then New York, then New York are a much smaller percentages, and some other parts of the country. Outside of the U.S., we had viewers from China, Israel, Canada, uh, Hong Kong, Mexico, Ireland, and U.K. So that is quite amazing considering that we live uh, in different time zones. So thank you uh, very much for spending the afternoon with us. It means a lot to us and to the work we do. Uh, many thanks to Covia, Roots Table Board and Management. 
a special gratitude to Margarita, uh, to Margarita Muxinova, program manager. Thank you for all your exceptional work facilitating all our four panels and stepping in this afternoon. Uh, as to you, the audience, keep thinking about tomorrow and the barriers that the older generation need to break and the bridges that need to be built. This conversation has to go on beyond this session. Thank you. And I'm sorry that I cannot see you. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you so much for joining Thank us. You. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Great to see Thank some familiar faces. Thank you, Hannah. Thank you, Margarita. Thank you. Yes, have a good thank you, Margarita. Thank you. Have a good Will evening. we be able, you'll send us how, where the recording happens? We'll be yes, able. the recording will be available uh, right after this event. I'll share it with you and with our audience. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. I have to get to my class. Bye-bye.